When we think of classic Greek sculptures, we think of beautiful, pure, chiseled marble. To this day, the idea of classical art, and even the revival of neoclassical art in the 18th and 19th centuries, conjures to the mind pristine white surfaces with finely carved details. Even our modern museums seem to light the statues to showcase the marble itself and make that marble glow. It comes as no surprise that we are then bewildered by the idea that ancient Greek statues didn't actually appear to the public in their raw, polished form. Instead, they were completely painted in vibrant colors. Upon closer observation, we can begin to see the color that has remained behind, from the red in the hair of the peplos cora, to the dark brown distinguishing the details of eyebrows and eyes upon various koroi and korai. For a while, scholars considered these remnants as outliers, as the naked eye picked up some pigment, but not on every statue. But it's hard to argue with history itself, when in 1885, archaic statues that had been buried for 2,500 years were unearthed, and with them, excellent preservation of their surface paint. Helen of Troy herself cements this as not an anomaly, in the same title played by Euripides, in which she says, If only I could shed my beauty and assume an uglier aspect, the way you would wipe color off a statue. This tells us that not only were Greek statues consistently painted, but they were considered more beautiful because of it and ugly without. The most common pigments found are white, red, black, and okra. These were the primary colors of the time and were believed to be linked through cosmology with the elements, air, water, fire, and earth. At the time, it would have been easy to classify a statue based on its color. It also answers the centuries-old question of how the ancient Greeks were supposed to be able to distinguish statuary on tall pediments. The paint would have provided that detail and contrast. Notably, pediments have been recovered with some coloration on the back of the sculptures, which wouldn't have been seen from the street eye level, but point out the importance of these works as what of offerings to the gods, so full detail would have been given. Despite knowing about the existence of the color, most of it has been worn down and lost to time. How can we then be able to see these statues and know their past? This is where light technology comes in. Vincennes Brinkman, using high-intensity lamps, ultraviolet light, specially designed cameras, plaster casts, and certain powdered minerals, was able to prove that the entire Parthenon, including the actual structure, as well as the statues, had all been brightly colored. And this is how we found Egyptian blue. During a photography session in which a different type of lighting was used, Nike's belt began to glow while exposed to the light. The pigment of Egyptian blue glows in the dark because it absorbs visible radiation and re-emits infrared radiation. Even trace amounts of Egyptian blue that are no longer visible to the naked eye glow white when exposed to this lighting. Egyptian blue was widely used across the Mediterranean as one of the only blue pigments besides the expensive lapis lazuli. Azurite was the only local blue pigment, but it had many other uses in the culture and was a more difficult pigment to work with as well as having a limited availability. Pigment wasn't the only thing that lighting found. What was similarly worn down from the same erosion was illuminated, incisions that made up geometric borders and patterns that were etched into the clothing for detail. Patterns have also been found by the decay of certain pigments, which revealed the color shadows of painted patterns, which exposed the marble to erosion quicker or slower, depending on the pigment that was used. The Peplos Cora is one of the most highly debated statues in terms of her identity and original coloration. Still known as the Peplos Cora, she instead depicts a goddess, likely Artemis. Her clothing is too intricate to simply be a Cora. She once held a metal object in her right fist, which is believed to have been arrows, matching the imagined left bow of her missing left hand. Also missing from her is the diadem that would have crowned her head, which is proven by the remaining divots in her head that would have anchored it. Such an elaborate crown was also indicative of the gods. Upon closer inspection, while mostly red pigment remains to be found on her, a pattern on the center front of her chitin depicts animals such as sphinxes and goats, as well as additional decorative geometric patterns to the side. We may never know which goddess she was created as, but we have many imaginations of what she may have looked like and who she is. 
The ingrained image of ancient Greek statues as pure white marble may never escape the ingrained cultural zeitgeist. We still feel an aesthetic truth to our materials, and even with evidence, have a hard time imagining obscuring such a beautiful material with paint. But with this technology and these reconstructions, we can begin to walk along those ancient streets and view this world that was rich in color and elaborate ornamentation.